think I'm, I'm live. I apologize for um, the technical difficulties uh, today. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Today's presentation um, is part of a continuing series for Elder Law Month sponsored by uh, Kahan Kerensky and Capicella. My name is attorney Bill Dakin. Um, I am a, a member of the estate planning department at Kahan Kerensky and Capicella as uh, several other attorneys. And we have a very robust staff of uh, very capable people to help uh, administer our uh, estate planning, probate, uh, trust services, elder law, um, a variety of estate planning and um, uh, elder law services that uh, you can get here at KKC. So again, without any further ado, today's presentation is uh, when to start thinking about long-term care. Uh, and as I, hopefully you've all gotten the materials, as I indicate in the um, beginning of the materials that uh, it only applies if you plan on getting older. And I, I kind of say that tongue in cheek, uh, but it's true that it, it's an issue that addresses all of us. Um, generally in our practice, we consider uh, elder law pretty much anytime we meet with a client, be it for themselves or possibly their involvement with others who may be in need for these services. Uh, I wanna correct one classic uh, misunderstanding regarding elder law uh, and long-term care services that many of you either here at KKC or perhaps you've uh, received some estate planning services elsewhere have prepared revocable living trusts and walked away with the notion that you're all set. And, and that is by, uh, by no means the accurate, that a, a living trust is a device for probate minimization. Oftentimes it can be used for um, uh, estate tax minimization, depending on what the exemptions are. Uh, matter of fact, as we all sit here on uh, Sanco de Mayo, um, we're, we're hearing constant um, discussions regarding changes in our tax laws. And, and as such, uh, I would hope that would prompt all of you to pull your wills and trusts and, and estate planning documents out of the drawers, uh, dust them off, take a look at them and make sure they're uh, up to date uh, with the new tax laws as those, those laws change. Um, but today's discussion is regarding long-term care uh, another common misperception that uh, we see frequently is people think that because they have Medicare, uh, because they purchased a Medicare supplement, or maybe have been fortunate enough to have uh, an employer provide for their um, health insurance through retirement, they think, again, they're all set and that all of this discussion about long-term care is not relevant to them. And again, that's a, a misconception that Medicare, Medicare supplements, all of those things are, are wonderful health insurance. And as the name implies, health insurance is for those who are sick. Uh, the problem is uh, getting old and uh, experiencing physical decline, uh, cognitive, cognitive decline. Fr frankly, those are things that are not considered illnesses and therefore services associated uh, custodial care services associated with addressing those deficiencies is not typically covered under any kind of Medicare plan. Um, and oftentimes you hear the word Medicare or the phrase Medicaid uh, used um, similarly when in fact they're different programs. Medicare is health insurance. Medicaid is welfare for the indigent. So, you know, again, most of us as we get older, um, are signing up for Medicare and, and doing Medicare supplements. But again, that's only for folks uh, who are ill. It doesn't cover custodial care services. Um, life expectancy is increasing. We're, um, doctors are doing such a terrific job of letting us all live till we're 100. Uh, the problem is it may not be uh, the exact quality of life that we envision. And, and as such, with diminished uh, physical abilities, cognitive abilities, uh, our ability to live alone or live without assistance is, is challenged. Um, some of us do better at this than others and the onset frankly is all over the lot. Uh, we've seen folks with um, uh, serious, cognitive, uh, serious declines in physical and cognitive abilities uh, in their 50s. Uh, and sometimes we, we see the 90 year old still skiing and playing golf. So it, it affects us all uh, a little differently. 
the, the point with long-term care is to plan ahead. Uh, and rather than simply accept the limited options that exist at the time you see your, your favorite lawyer, uh, it would be best to plan ahead, think about these things at various intervals in your life. And, and that's why today's presentation, what I tried to do, and again, hopefully all of you folks receive the materials, um, the materials are designed to, for or broken into age brackets, whereby uh, it was my thinking in preparing for today's presentation that I break it down kind of by category and give you uh, uh, reason to believe that at each of those various, uh, I broke it down in 10 year intervals, it, it's relevant to consider long term care and the different issues it uh, raises at, at various points throughout your life. Uh, the key is the, the first timeline is please don't wait until it's too late. Um, and again, it's always best to get uh, capable advice from, from ourself or others. Um, but if you wait till it's too late, um, it's the options are much more limited. Um, having said that, uh, I can't even recall of a situation where a, a client um, came to us with a long term care issue, e either on the eve of institutionalization or sometime prior to that we couldn't improve their situation, that typically there's always something to do. Um, the value and quality of those things increases with, um, with planning. Uh, if you enter the situation in a crisis, uh, we'll help you manage the crisis. Uh, and there still may be some planning and restructuring to do along that line, but uh, more often than not, uh, the options are gonna be uh, somewhat limited. Um, if you wait till it's too late, you're already experiencing significant physical and cognitive deficiencies. Uh, most importantly, you may have already spent significant funds on private caregivers. Um, it, we see that situation uh, routinely that uh, people just accept the fact that if they need services, they'll go out and hire those services and use their funds to pay without realizing that perhaps uh, they may qualify for governmental assistance and, and use the government's money to pay for those services rather than their own. Uh, so that's the concept uh, with long-term care planning is uh, to the extent that you wish or uh, qualify um, to use the government's uh, program under Medicaid, medical assistance for the in indigent. Uh, and again, indigent is a very complex definition and, and we'll get into that a little bit today. Uh, but more significantly, next week at the presentation, we'll, we'll get into uh, a lot of the details regarding Medicaid eligibility. So I would encourage you all uh, to sign up again for, for next week's program, and Attorney Poirier will, will review those issues in greater detail. But I'll, I'll touch on some of them today. Um, the most important thing with regards to um, people who come in a little late uh, and they've already expended a significant amount of funds, not only do you have less money to, to try to protect, uh, but sometimes there's not even sufficient funds to do proper spend down planning. For instance, um, the, a common notion that people have is, well, once I get sick, I, I'm not allowed to give any more, and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, look back period, um, and they feel they have to spend all of their money on uh, long-term care caregiver services, and, and that's not true. Uh, there's a list of options that you have in terms of allowable spend down, um, but it's not just spending money on your care. You can improve your house. You can buy a prepaid funeral contract. You can pay down debt and mortgages. As long as you're spending the money on yourself, uh, the government does not have a significant concern. Um, in addition, if folks come to us early enough, it may be possible to convert some of their assets into an income stream. Medicaid eligibility is based primarily as an asset test, uh, and it's possible uh, to restructure assets such that you have less assets, therefore increase your eligibility, um, and take those assets that would have otherwise uh, rendered you ineligible and convert them into an irrevocable income stream. And there, there's reasons to and, and not to do that, but it's least on the list, but if you wait till you, it's too late in the game, that may be one of the options that, that's limited. And as I mentioned a moment ago, um, 
the gifting or trying to save assets by uh, passing them on to children or other loved ones uh, is not going to be possible if you wait too long. There's a look back period. Um, and it's not that the government necessarily comes and chases these folks, although there are certain recovery rights in the law. Uh, but the government's job is simple. Uh, you provide them information, they evaluate whether or not you've made any gifts. And if you've made gifts within the five years prior to application, they just stamp your application denied and send you on your way. So it's not, the government's not in the business of being a collection agent. Uh, they're here to determine eligibility. And if you're not eligible, they leave you to fend for yourself. So it's frankly up to you to go back to that child and try to recover the assets and, and try to figure out how you're going to live the rest of your days. So anyway, with all that happy news, um, in, in my materials, uh, the first date or time I, I have selected here is age 80. And I provide some sample symptoms of what an age, a typical age 80 uh, client that walks in uh, to our office, that they're starting to encounter physical and cognitive decline. They may have other health issues. Uh, perhaps their spouse has passed away. They're living alone. Uh, and they're beginning to have a need uh, for reliance on others for services. Uh, and they could experience this crisis I've been uh, alluding to at any moment. Now is the time at age 80 to really have a, a serious discussion about restructuring assets. How are things owned? Uh, so it's a question, we, we get into a fair amount of details when we're interviewing our clients and ask them to provide us uh, the financial documentation, but it's important to know how assets are owned, uh, whether they're individually owned, whether they're owned jointly with another, whether they're in a trust, whether there's beneficiary designations, all of those details are relevant and frankly may have to be modified uh, to uh, accomplish objectives or improve eligibility for medical assistance. Uh, there's also tax implications. For instance, if um, you have a large retirement account or an IRA, um, and that's going to render you ineligible for assistance, and you want to gift that asset to uh, your child or transfer it to your spouse, um, you have tax implications because those assets can't be transferred intact. They, you must first withdraw the money, incur the liability, and then transfer those to others. And so while you're doing that, and sometimes that's uh, an unfortunate result of uh, a healthcare crisis and planning for long-term care uh, as we get older, but be sure to withhold a su sufficient amount of income from the IRA or 401k withdrawals so that when it comes tax time, um, you're not looking around for money to pay the taxes because it's possible you spend all that money on gifting or care. Uh, and then April 15th comes along and you have an income tax liability and there's no money to pay that. Now you have the IRS in the state of Connecticut looking at you saying uh, you owe us some money. So uh, again, it, it's possible in some, in some of the gifting and restructuring, uh, if done poorly or improperly, you almost end up with more problems than, than what you started with. Another question that arises when you're age 80 is, is where to live. Um, are you living alone? Uh, are you living at your home? Uh, are you living with others? Is there an extra bedroom at the end of the hallway that if you needed a, a full-time live-in caregiver, there's a place for that person to stay with you? Uh, are you considering an assisted living facility or, or is your medical need so significant that your only option perhaps may be institutionalization? Uh, and you need to start thinking about, uh, I'll say, the rest of your life uh, and where are you going to live? How is this going to play out? Uh, it, it's one thing to have goals and say, I want to spend the rest of my day in my home. Uh, but if that doesn't make the most, most sense as you consider all the options, then unfortunately, you may have to adjust where and how you live. Um, also be thinking, who will provide for the additional care that you need at that time? And will there be a cost for that care? Um, again, with family, uh, many times they'll render services gratuitously. Um, sometimes family members expect to be paid. Uh, be careful if you're going down that road in the sense that the Department of Social Services will view all monies transferred to family members as being uh, performed gratuitously, uh, in other words, a gift, 
uh, even though there are services being provided. So in those instances, it's best to enter into uh, your loved one or family member uh, for the services rendered. So it's a contractual legal obligation and can be distinguished from a gift. Uh, similarly, at this time at age 80, you should be reviewing all of your uh, powers of attorney, healthcare directives, and those types of things uh, to make sure that you're happy with those that have been, that you've selected to assist you with your financial and health matters. Um, maybe the decisions you made previously are not the best, uh, particularly if you're going to be changing your situs, if you're going to be moving in with a kid or uh, a different, um, different place. So be thinking about those documents as well. Uh, Medicaid also, for, for those of you who are not aware, has an in-home care program that provides cost-free assistance, again, provided you are, are eligible. And there's also a, a medical need as well as a financial need to qualify. Um, the home care program is something that we often review with clients who are, uh, again, experiencing some physical or cognitive decline. Uh, and this is a program that, frankly, has become extremely popular. Uh, matter of fact, kudos to the state of Connecticut. Uh, 20 years or more at this point, uh, Connecticut was one of the first states in the, the country to initiate the Medicaid waiver program that allowed for folks um, to receive custodial care services uh, with governmental assistance in their home rather than being forced to um, be admitted to a, an, an institution, a nursing home of sorts. Um, so again, kudos to the state of Connecticut, but the program is quite robust. And, and I wanna say the predominant number of clients who we end up working with uh, and helping them through this crisis and where they're gonna live the rest of their days, um, most of them, or a good number of them, are, are living at home or living in residential settings. So trying to improve the quality of life and frankly, the type of care you receive uh, in a home setting is, I think, a, a little better uh, in the sense that you've got one-on-one -on -one services at your beck and call versus in an institutional setting. Uh, granted, there's some great um, institutions out there, facilities and good staff, uh, but they're working, you know, three, four, five staff uh, for a floor of 40 people. And there's so much so, only so many hours in a day that they're available to assist folks. Also at age 80, uh, we, again, as I've been implying, we, we kind of do a dry run uh, of the Medicaid application process and evaluate your eligibility. And, and that's what kind of triggers the discussion for, gee, should we, we change things around a little bit? Uh, one common uh, misperception, again, is that uh, let's just say I'm, uh, I'm married, uh, I'm the sick person, I'm just going to transfer all my assets to my spouse. She loves me, she's going to take care of me. Um, there, now I'm broke, now I'm eligible for Medicaid. It, it doesn't work that way. Medicaid eligibility views the financial income and assets of both spouses. So if you're married, the, the service is going to look at the total balance sheet of both spouses, in which case moving assets from one spouse to another doesn't really help. Uh, this particularly becomes a problem in second marriages uh, where the, you, know, you may have a, a special deal with your, your spouse that you know, my assets are mine, yours are yours, uh, but when it comes to Medicaid eligibility, uh, that whole plan gets shot in the foot and uh, needs to be reconsidered. That if you know, if the if your spouse, regardless of any private deal, the state's going to ignore the private assets of that spouse as part of the application process, and part of which could render you ineligible for governmental assistance. Uh, engage a professional, seek advice, uh, do the analysis, uh, particularly with the application in front of you, and, and do a dry run to see how. Um, to see how best uh, manage your assets. So again, age 80 is kind of you're in the fires. Uh, age 70, you're 10 years removed from the fires. Uh, you're probably retired. You're thinking of downsizing, maybe moving. Um, you're certainly thinking that it's time to enjoy the fruits of your labor, um, but you're starting to have some medical issues. 
it, it's time to start thinking again, who will you rely on for care and support? Consider the logistics. I mean, the most common paradigm that we see is everyone wants to sell their, their four bedroom colonial uh, and downsize to a smaller place or, or move to Arizona or Florida. Does it really make sense to move 1500 miles away from your family uh, when you're anticipated at some point to have physical or cognitive decline or impairment. Now your primary support system is, is logistically not close. Granted, in today's world of technology, you can do a lot of things from afar, uh, but to stop in and check on uh, mom and dad or to make sure their pill buckets are full every day, uh, those are things that you're not gonna be able to do remotely. It's best done locally. And again, if you're separated from your family, that's gonna be harder. Um, so I would give you pause that if, if you're thinking of moving, again, enjoying the fruits of your labor, I would venture a guess that it's a temporary thing and you better also have a backup plan for when the crisis hits uh, and things get serious uh, and the golf days are over, uh, where are you gonna live? Who are you gonna live close to? Uh, in, in, again, ho in hopes of relying on family for support. Uh, you also, if you're going to move, you know, at this point in your life, maybe you are generally pretty healthy. Uh, but as you uh, become more challenged in that regard, have you evaluated the healthcare network at your new location if you are going to move? What are the doctors like? What are the uh, support services like? Uh, what are their costs or what is their quality? Are you still getting, you know, coming back to Connecticut for your healthcare? Uh, you know, those are uh, issues that become strained uh, if you don't think them through. Uh, and the key is, again, if envisioning that we're all going to get older, we're all going to start developing deficiencies, start thinking about, you know, caregiver services, who's going to provide for them, and what are the costs of those services. Um, and again, it's best uh, that in those situations that usually at my age 70s clients, those are the ones that are starting the aggressive gifting programs that they're trying to get to the good side of the five year look back period. Um, the, the theory is or the, the law is if I've made any gift within five years of my application for medical assistance, um, that gift has to be put back Otherwise, I am ineligible. They're going to calculate an ineligibility period uh, resulting from that gift. So the, the goal is, under current rules, if you can get to the other side of the five-year window, you're safe. Uh, if you wait too late in life to be making these gifts, uh, chances are you're not going to get to the other side of the five-year window. Uh, so gifting while you're young enough um, but not too young because, again, you still have to live the rest of your life and enjoy your retirement. So it's a delicate balance of how much do I give, what assets do I protect, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the things that become common uh, when you're talking about gifting is the, the home. Um, someone, uh, you know, the common example is to gift my house with a retained life use, or also very important, the, the family home, uh, where logistics, uh, you know, that's something that's proven to be special. Your kids may have used it when they were young. Now their kids are coming along. It, it's a good gatherings point, uh, becomes very sentimental. Uh, and again, trying to protect it in a way that you pass it on to the next generation uh, is important. Uh, Clearly, again, um, when you're talking about gifting, compliance with the gift tax rules, currently the exemption amounts uh, are so wonderfully generous that it's not an issue today. Uh, but given some of the speculation uh, in bills that we see floating around in our legislatures uh, gives us cause for concern, it may be, uh, may be timely to consider a gift before the law change such that uh, you get in under the wire, not only the five years, uh, but also being uh, gifting that asset uh, when it's not going to create a gift tax problem. Dropping back another decade into your 60s, so you know, at, at age 60, you're, you're planning your retirement. You're thinking about buying the vacation home. You're pretty healthy. You get the notice from uh, the government to sign up for Medicare when you're 65. Uh, kind of your, your, your first uh, introduction to becoming old, um, but uh, get over it. Uh, we're all going to hopefully get there. 
Um, at this point, you should be considering the merit of long-term care insurance. And is it cost effective? Is it for you? Uh, in your 60s, uh, and I kind of defer to uh, the financial services folks and insurance experts on this point, but in, in my practice, the, the early 60s are, are like the uh, fork in the road, as, as stated by Robert Frost in that poem. Um, you, you have to pick one way or another, that to buy long-term care insurance when you're older, um, the, the cost of the premium is going to be significant. Not that it's inexpensive um, at, a, at too early of an age. It tends to be a fairly costly product, uh, depending on the benefits that you're purchasing. Uh, but also just be aware that 60s is the time when you need to kind of make that decision. I either am going to be insured or I've chosen not to be insured and I'll deal with it uh, in another way. Uh, but it's also timely to review your overall estate plan, update your powers of attorney, uh, consider probate avoidance, uh, and estate tax minimization are probably the bigger issues. Uh, but also just talk about uh, with your advisor long-term care options uh, and kind of get information and get ready and start thinking about some of those difficult decisions and questions that I've raised this afternoon uh, before they become crisis mode. So what happens at age 50? Why, why do I need to be thinking about long-term care at age 50? You know, life is good. You're probably in your 50s an empty nester. Uh, all of a sudden, you, you, your paycheck isn't going out the door as fast as it used to be. You're starting to save some money, uh, working hard, feeling great. What's the problem? Well, if you're like most 50-year-olds or 60-year-olds, you're part of that sandwich generation. And uh, just as the kids leave, the parents start knocking saying, gee, can you stop by and help me? I need uh, assistance with this, that, or the other thing. Um, so from at age 50, you're starting to think about long-term care, not so much as how it relates to you, but gee, have my parents done their plan? Uh, you know, are they, if they're going to be looking to me for care, I want to make sure that uh, they're taking advantage of all the options that they have uh, and starting to do the planning. So maybe, maybe you'll, you take them by the hand and bring them to your favorite law firm uh, and get them some advice regarding their long-term care plan. Because most folks in, in that generation uh, you know, that have lived through the, the depression and all, they, they probably think a will is all you really need. And obviously the, the misunderstanding with a will is a will assumes that you're gonna have assets left when you die. And, and really what we see is an unfortunate paradigm these days when every last nickel you've ever earned is spent on your long-term care and you die broke um, without any assets to pass on. So although a will is important and we certainly encourage people to have wills, it makes an assumption that may, may not play out the way you expect. And therefore planning on other options that are frankly more likely to occur like illness and need for assistance as you get older, um, I, I think you need to redirect those plans a little bit. At least gather information, uh, point your parents in a direction, encourage them to do some research and, and get informed. Um, and then obviously I throw in age 40 and younger, uh, you're, you're young, you're, you're working, you're raising your family, generally healthy. Uh, but again, um, be thinking that someday when the parents come over to visit, uh, they're going to be asking you for assistance. So again, it's, it's kind of encouraging you to uh, be, become informed and, and get educated. That's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Uh, come back, I think it's same time, same station. Uh, next week, attorney Allison Poirier will be talking about some of the specifics of the Medicaid application process uh, and the eligibility rules associated with that. Um, I'm just going to look here quickly uh, for any questions. If you have some, please. Um, I should have looked at this earlier. Um, I apologize if my mic uh, had static. Here's a question. Is there a thumbnail estimate for the cost of long-term long care insurance for one person male age 60 that I can use for planning purposes? Oh boy. Um, 
it's like an alien coming down from uh, from Mars saying, how much does a car cost? Uh, <laughs> it kind of depends if it's a 10 year old uh, Chevy or it's a state of the art Mercedes. Um, uh, that's long term care is it depends what you buy. Uh, if I'm just going to throw a number out there and I apologize in advance to all my uh, financial services relationships, uh, I'll say uh, anywhere between $2,500 a year to $5,000 a year for, uh, I'll say, an average product. Um, but again, that's just uh, uh, one man's guess that um, it, it depends on what you're buying. Any other questions? Give you folks a second to type and hit the send button. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So absent questions coming forward. Uh, I'm gonna sign off. And again, I wish you folks uh, the best. Thank you for joining this presentation today. And again, please come back again next week uh, where we'll uh, entertain as well with some uh, additional detail on Medicaid eligibility and long-term care. Thank you again. Take care.